ευχαριστώ πολύ. A small correction. I, I'm, uh, I wrote the movie The Hyperglot and I acted in it. I didn't direct it. That was a friend of mine, but nevertheless, don't worry. Um, right, okay. So, uh, yeah, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, my name is Michael Levi Harris. I'm an actor. Um, uh, and as was said, I, I, I have been in the, the hyperglot. That's the only thing you might know me from. Some of you, I think, uh, have told me you know me. Otherwise, I'm not famous. So if you're scratching your head, who is this guy? That's the only thing you'd have seen me in, uh, unless you've been to some really small theaters in New York City uh, a while ago. I recently graduated from the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London. And so a lot of what I talk about in terms of relating acting to language learning comes from what I learned there in my three years doing a very, very intensive uh, master's degree in acting. Um, so let me tell you this, let's just get this out of the way. This presentation's gonna be a little weird, okay? Uh, it's gonna be slightly different uh, than probably some of the other things you've seen. Uh, it's not particularly scientific. Um, I hope it will be entertaining. I hope it will be informative. Um, and uh, but I think if you if you just bear with me, bear with the it's gonna, the the kookiness. Um, I think you might learn what you're all craving, which is to solve the mystery of how to be the most multilingual polyglot in the world. Right? <laughs> no. <laughs> Joking aside, I think hopefully you'll learn a few tools. Um, to help you on your polyglot adventures. Um, just a quick show of hands. How many people have, uh, have heard me speak in Berlin? Okay, so most of you, I'm, I'm new face. Uh, that, that's good. Um, just, I'm going to throw in little bits of advi acting advice. I, I, the reason I ask is I like to know my audience. So actors, we, as much as we can, we know our audience. We know who we're talking to um, and the context of what we're talking about. Um, so that's why I asked that question, and I think it's useful uh, as, as practitioners of, um, of languages and different, uh, speaking different languages. Suddenly my computer froze. Oh, there we go. Okay. So the premise of this talk, as illustrated by these fun cartoon characters on my cover slide, is that um, languages, in my experience, have different characters. And a way that you can tap into a language to get better at it, and if you speak multiple languages, to not confuse them and differentiate between them better, is to give them characters. So how can I, I thought, as an actor, something I can offer this incredible community is how do actors build characters and can linguists do the same thing for their languages? Um, now a word of, I'm gonna talk about two specific acting tools. There are tons of tools out there. I spent three years um, grilling and drilling them. Uh, I'm just gonna talk about two for the moment because I only have 50 minutes. Um, a word of caution first. I'm going to be painting with a very broad brush. So for those of you who don't know that expression, let me briefly explain it. If you imagine painting, you know, and you've, if you were painting a house, you'd use a very wide brush so you can just sort of get it on the walls of, of the outside. If you were painting something really specific and detailed, you'd need a very fine brush, okay? Um, what, what is the benefit of a big brush? You can get the color. You can get a, a kind of a general idea if I wanted to show you, you know, a big house. Uh, if I had the side of this wall and I was just going to kind of demonstrate a house, I might do something that was rectangular and there'd be a smaller rectangle to represent the door um, and some windows. And you would probably get that it's a house and you might get my feelings about the house if I painted it uh, bright pink as opposed to dark gray. Um, but it wouldn't look very realistic. It's general. If I wanted to make it very realistic, I would need a very fine brush and I would need to spend a lot of time doing all the little details. So everything I'm talking about is big brushes. Now why am I prefacing that? I don't want to offend anybody. Um, it's gonna get, it, it could get offensive. Um, but the, the, the point is, the point is that Actors use whatever tools we can for the final product. It's all in the name of the final product. We want to convey our story very well, as best we can. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll use anything that, that, we, that we need. 
I mean, barring a dead body could be useful if you're playing a serial killer, we use our imagination instead. But um, mo for, the most, for the most part, whenever possible, we use what we can get our hands on. Um, now, uh, to demonstrate what I'm talking about uh, with these tools, I'm gonna show you a very short clip from a very funny movie uh, called The Birdcage. And my friend, the ironically, uh, I don't know why I called him my friend. I never met the man, but my uh, um, <laughs> the ironically inimitable Robin Williams is going to help demonstrate uh, this point in a second. Armand, did you see what he just did? Hello, Valley, darling. What did he do? He blew a bubble with his gum while I was singing. He can't do that while I'm singing! Celsius, look, this may be a drag show, but it still has to be a good drag show. If possible, a great drag show. Yes, and just because you're 22 and hung doesn't mean you're... Let me do this, Albert. Fine, you're the director. Thank you. This is a complex number full of mythic themes. The woman who is singing invented you. You are her fantasy. And suddenly, you, the fantasy, see her, your inventor, and she becomes your fantasy. I don't think I get it. Try more gum. Albert. I hear you. Thank you, I know you do. Celsius, you have to explore it. But let's start with the premise that when you see this stunning, smoldering creature, she transcends your desire to chew, she electrifies you. Something starts in your pelvis and works its way towards your heart, where it becomes heart slash pelvis. Pop. Yes? Coming. What about me? What do I do? Do I just stand here like an object? No. You do an eclectic celebration of the dance. You do fussy, fussy, fussy. You do Martha Graham, Martha Graham, Martha Graham. Or Twyla, Twyla, Twyla. Or Michael Kidd, Michael Kidd, Michael Kidd, Michael Kidd. Or Madonna, Madonna, Madonna. But you keep it all inside. <laughs> okay. So Our just... Mind, it, oh. Did you see what he just did? Do Hello, watch again? Okay. Um, so uh, I'll just recap that because I apologize about the sound. Uh, I promise I tested it right before you all arrived and suddenly it went off. Um, what he said, the, the sort of the clinch line of that, of that clip was what he said at the very end, you keep it all inside. This is what actors do when in rehearsal and in preparation we spend a lot of time um, practicing things, trying things out, we, we take risks, we might, be, we might do something that's ridiculous. Um, and then, but on the stage, once we get out in public and perform, we leave it. We forget about the tools, trusting that if we've done enough practice and preparation, um, the little bit that we need to help convey the story will, will remain and will come out in the performance. At the same time, what Robin Williams was demonstrating, um, is, to great comedic effect, is that uh, the, a lot of times an actor has a lot going on inside. They literally can be having a, a Madonna crazy dance in their head, but outside you don't see it. But for them, for the actor, it does something um, to help portray whatever he wants to portray. So that's the idea behind these tools that I'm about to share with you, is that you, you, will, um, you work on them, you, 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 go, you, you go to the extreme in the privacy of your own home, in your own rehearsal space, or with friends who you know, share, who wanna explore this with you as well, um, when you're practicing your languages. But then when you go out and you try to speak to a native speaker, you don't want to offend them, um, you, so you, you and you want to uh, befriend them, and therefore you kind of you leave them behind, and you just trust that um, a little bit of the character that you've created in the privacy of your own home will improve the way you're speaking the language. That's that's my theory. And how did I develop this? I am not an expert in anything, um, but I what I what the feedback I get when I speak foreign languages frequently is, wow, you speak it really well, or you have a really good accent, or a really good ear, or I didn't know you were American. And what I try to do is to kind of codify what it is that I'm doing, uh, sometimes consciously and sometimes more outwardly. Um, more visibly than others, uh, but it, it's to codify what I do naturally, the part of me that um, is naturally an actor that I thought maybe if I can codify it, I would share with, with all of you. So, so the first uh, tool, oh. The first tool uh, is called, I had a little uh, translation problem between Mac Keynote, whatever that thing is called, and PowerPoint. So um, all this said was the name of the, of the tool. Um, 
which is uh, we call it uh, level uh, levels of tension in the body. So there is a, a French actor, mime, and uh, friend, and acting teacher called Jacques Lecoq, and he observed that most people, most of the time, um, display seven levels of tension in their body in terms of how they move and also how they speak. Um, and so I'm going to share them with you and then I'm going to do a little rehearsal process for you uh, by demonstrating a, a little excerpt from a play um, uh, to, to show you how to employ each of these levels of energy. First I'll describe them. So the first one, the first level is called exhausted. Okay, can, can people see me? Should I yeah, can you see me? Okay, so exhausted is, um, you, you don't move. You're just in this kind of, it's really hard to move. It could be really hard to get the words out. It, it's not necessarily slow, but comparative to the other energies, it's probably fairly slow. Um, some people call this level catatonic. I'm gonna come back to that. Um, catatonic as in a catatonic stupor where you, you, you can't move. Um, the next level is called l'americano, which I find very funny. I am American, if you couldn't tell. Um, or also some people call it a, um, a Californian. So the Californian, uh, he can move, but he's not in a hurry to get anywhere. He just sort of, he meanders a bit, um, and, and life's easy, you know, he's pretty, pretty relaxed. Um, the next level up from that is neutral. Neutral is efficient and economic. So think of, uh, of a character who plays a butler um, in a movie other than the butler, you know, where he's not the main character and his job is just, you know, to sort of stand in the background and then, um, you know, the countess of so-and-so arrives and he goes to take her coat and doesn't do what I just did because he's a trained butler. Um, and then he gets it back and he put, and he hangs it up and, and uh, he goes back to position. So he's, everything he does is efficient and economic. Or she, why can't we have a, a butleress? Um, the, the next level up from that is uh, called alert. So alert um, is it, there's a bit there's a bit you start to see more tension in the movement, meaning that um, he do, I don't just move from 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 one place to another in a direct line, but because something might happen, and I and I'm very aware of everything that's around me. So there's just a bit of heightened um, stopping and starting. Possibly uh, this is this is an alert phase to be in. So every every sort of light movement or sound. I'm there. It's kind of childlike. You could also call it naive because you're just aware. It's not. Some of these may have these words may have negative connotations. They're not necessarily negative. It can be. You can be very joyfully alert um, as well. Um, next one up from that is dramatic. So dramatic. We now it starts to get a bit more fun because for for actors anyway. Um, because the, the, these are big movements, you know, you, you've got something to say and you need your whole body to say it and your, and your voice, um, your level, your pitch level starts fluctuating more and, 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 and sometimes it can be a joyous dramatic and it can be a really funny dramatic or it can be really serious. Um, that's dramatic. Oh, I've, <laughs> in, my, in my drama, I've already taken to the next level, which is operatic. So oper operatic is more passionate. It is over the top. For a, for a room this size. And it doesn't have to necessarily be about volume because you can be over the top quiet, can't you? And if I look at somebody really intensely, that's kind of over the top, isn't it? <laughs> so this, this is over the top. Um, that is operatic. Now, how do we top that? So, so the last level, the highest uh, energy level, I learned very odd, you know, strangely enough, as catatonic. That catatonic, I think, was referring to catatonic excitement where you suddenly get really loud and you just have these very bursts, you, know, you have strange bursts that you almost can't control. Um, but in the spirit of where we are, I'm going to call the last one, Grecian. <laughs> it is tragic. Sorry, sorry for the space on there. So let me, let me just uh, turn the lights back on for a second and I'm gonna demonstrate these for you. Uh, no? There we go, right. Um, so. Uh, you won't probably be able to see that at the moment, but just, just bear with me. Now, huh, when I planned this talk, for some reason in my head there was going to be like one of those TED Talk ear microphones. Um, uh, because I tend to be better with, with two hands at, at most things. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, um, the reason why it's relevant here is because this, this excerpt from a play, the play is called Children of a Lesser God, um, and it is about the, the character I'm going to rehearse for you. This is not a performance, this is a rehearsal. Um, the character I'm going to rehearse is, is uh, a speech-language pathologist who teaches at a school for the deaf, and he's talking to a deaf woman, and so he's signing at the same time. So I could... Now, it is possible, I mean, deaf people go to parties and they have a drink in one hand and they sign with the other. It's kind of like the, the, the signing is signing equivalent of talking with your mouth full, except it's less, you know, socially uh, awkward. Uh, it's just uh, maybe the watcher has to be a bit more attentive, possibly. Or let me just, actually, if I do that, you, I know you can hear me. Can you hear me in the, for the, is that, no? Yeah? Good enough? All right, this is better than talking with my mouth full. My hands full. Um, <laughs> okay, so first level. The first level was um, exhausted. So here we go, little excerpt. You want to be independent of me? You want to be a, a person in your own right? You don't want people to pity you, but you want them to understand you in the very poetic way that you describe in your speech and in the, in the plain old boring way that normal people understand each other, well, then you learn to read my lips and you learn to use that mouth of yours for something besides eating and showing me that you're better than hearing girls in bed. Second level, l'americano. Not in a rush, uh, but, he, but he's a little bit more animated. You want to be independent of me? You want to be a, a, a person in your own right? You don't want people to pity you, but you want them to understand you in the very poetic way that you describe in your speech and in the plain old boring way that normal people understand each other will then you learn to read my lips, and you learn to use that m mouth of yours for, for something besides eating and showing me that you're better than hearing girls in bed. Neutral. You want to be independent of me? You want to be a person in your own right. You don't want people to pity you, but you want them to understand you in the very poetic way that you describe in your speech and in the plain old boring way that normal people understand each other, well then you learn to read my lips. And you learn to use that mouth of yours for something besides eating and showing me that you're better than hearing girls in bed. Alert. You wanna be independent of me? You, you want to be a, a person in, in your own right. You, you don't want people to pity you, but you, you want them to understand you in the very poetic way that you describe in your speech and in the plain old boring way that uh, normal people understand each other. Well, then you learn to read my lips. And you learn to use that mouth of yours for something besides eating and showing me that you're better than hearing girls in bed. Dramatic. <laughs> you want to be independent of me? You want to be a person in your own right? You don't want people to pity you, but you want them to understand you in the very poetic way that you describe in your speech and in the plain old boring way that normal people understand each other. Well then, you learn to read my lips. And you learn to use that mouth of yours for something besides eating and showing me that you're better than hearing girls in bed. Operatic. <laughs> you want to be independent of me. You want to you be a, a person in your own right. You don't want people to pity you, but you want them to understand you in the very poetic way that you describe in your speech. And in the plain old boring way that normal people understand each other, well then, you learn to, to read my lips and you learn to use that mouth of yours for something besides eating, showing me that you're better than hearing girls in bed. Grecian. <laughs> you want to be independent? 
independent of me? You want to be a, a person in your own right? <laughs> I forgot the line. <laughs> I think, I think you got the idea, though. I, uh, I'm going to move on time, for time, time's sake. So right now, I just had a look from one of my northern English friends that says to me, right, this is mildly entertaining, but what in God's green earth does this have to do with language learning? <laughs> Let me tell you. Um, oh, wrong, wrong computer. Uh, okay, lights. Um, so my idea, uh, before lights, my idea is that each of these levels can be used um, or ascribed to a different language. Um, now, something very important to remember. Two things, actually. One, this is personal. This is a decision that we all make. So what I, a language that I might think sounds neutral, for whatever reason I might think that, you might say, what are you talking about? That language is totally catatonic, as you say it very catatonically. Um, <laughs> That's fine. There's, there, there is no right answer to this. The point is that you're using your experiences and your observations and your intuition to come to a decision. And I do think, based on many cultural and linguistic stereotypes, that a lot of us might put certain languages in the same category. I think that that would happen. Um, but that's not really the point. The point is, is, to, is to use the tool as it will help you. Uh, the other thing to think about is that it is, and this is true of, of characters that you play, and it's true of people, and I think it's true of languages. No one person, character, or language is only one of these things. A lot of it has to do with context, the mood you're in, the weather, whatever. Um, you, you, they move in between each other. Um, but I do think that characters and people and languages have um, a sort of one that they t gravitate towards more regularly. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you um, how I, where I use these. Uh, turn the lights off again. All right, so exhausted. <laughs> now, I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you noticed, but when I, first when I first demonstrated Exhausted, and even the first time around when I just talked about Exhausted, I actually didn't change my anything. That's just how I talk. And it's not because I'm always tired, although I am very frequently tired. Um, I just, to me, the sound of American English, I think possibly owing to long, you know, elongated vowels, um, diphthongs that have lots of sounds in them, to me that makes it sound quite at the exhausted state. Um, and just as a reminder, these, some of these words may sound negative. These are, try to divorce the literal meaning and think of them as classifications. Swiss French, I also think, um, has that sound to it. Um, L'Americano, Brazilian Portuguese, I mean, immediately comes to mind when you speak Brazilian Portuguese. It just, it rarely sounds like it, it's in a rush. It rarely, you know, it, 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 it's got all day for you, you know, it's totally relaxed. And same with Australian English, I think. Um, and, and there probably are Australians who speak, who can speak quickly. I've never met any. They frequently, um, it's, it, it is a very, it's a slow sound. Um, and a lot of these, I think, do have to do with environment, um, uh, where people are speaking these languages. Neutral, efficient, economic. What's the cultural stereotype? German. <laughs> to me, German sounds very um, in that level of it, it does what it says on the tin, and it says, you know, if it says that it will take you five minutes and 40 seconds to make this tuna fish, it will take exactly that long. Um, I also think Finnish, and I don't speak a word of Finnish, well, I don't speak more than three words of Finnish, and I, uh, but to me it, it has a similar um, setting. Uh, alert British English, RP. Um, when I speak RP, which I had to do at school in, in London, um, it, f the, the way that I approach it, the way I get at it, I c this one I can demonstrate for you more easily than the others, um, I suddenly become very alert in my voice. It's my pitch level rises and falls much more easily. Um, and, and there is, um, I don't know, I, it, it's just, it's, it's really alert. That's, that's, that's how I do RP. Um, and to be very honest, I managed to convince um, the head of casting at the National Theatre that I was not American. So I think I've done a good job of it. Um, 
dramatic, español. It always sounds very dramatic. Spanish and Greek, the, everything that, that, that you hear, it just, it has that, it's on that level for me. Um, operatic, Italian, it's passionate. Yiddish as well, those two, that's what that other flag is. Yiddish and Italian for me have a, have a, have a passionate operatic sound. And then the Grecian, the catatonic, is Chinese and Russian. Now, if we have time at the end, I will go back and sort of explain more specifically why I chose these, but I'm going to move to the next tool, and for the next tool, I, I will walk you through the analytic reasons why I uh, associate certain languages with certain um, uh, categories in the next um, tool. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move on and maybe come back to this if, if we have time. So the second tool is, is called uh, the Laban Efforts. Um, Laban was a movement person um, of German, I think it was German, um, and he observed that there are eight types of physical movement. Um, uh, and the eight types come from three uh, categories there, uh, of movement through space. So there's weight, uh, and the, the, these, these uh, little illustrations are to sort of demonstrate what's on the other side. So um, heavy and light. Um, movement can be heavy or light. Uh, some people call it strong and weak. Um, space, uh, if you look here, we have a little alpha and a little omega. You can have a direct movement from alpha to omega, or you can have an indirect movement from alpha to omega, which are in the same positions. And then frequency, either the frequency of what's being m moved is, uh, is sustained or it's sudden. Um, so the way that these... Uh, the, the way that these are constructed is that I've grouped them into, and there's lots of different ways you can do this, it's the same eight uh, results, but I'm gonna group them this way, so that each time we start with one movement, all we have to do is change one, um, one aspect and you get a different type of movement. So the first type of movement is called pressing. Pressing is heavy, uh, and there will be, you see there's two columns, heavy and light, there's gonna be four movements that are heavy and four movements that are light. Um, there will also be four movements that are direct and four movements that are indirect. And if you see down here, there will be four that are sustained and four that are, are sudden. Um, so the first one is pressing, and I'll just try to demonstrate this. Oops, what did I do? Okay. Um, can you still see it? Good. Uh, so direct movement in the space. If I want to go from here to there, I'm just walking this way. Um, if I want it to be heavy, there's, there's a weight to my walk. I'm still going um, in the same direction, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be slow. I'm just illustrating that for you, that it's, it's heavy. And uh, if it's sustained, it means that it, it, it's an even movement, okay? So this is a heavy, sustained, um, direct movement. It's pressing. Now I'm going to change one aspect. Um, I have to write this down because I always can't keep it straight. So I'm going to change one thing. I'm going to keep the heavy, and I'm going to keep the uh, direct, but I'm, no, sorry. What have I done? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep, I'm going to keep the heavy, and I'm, yeah, and I'm going to keep the direct, but I'm going to change to um, sudden, and then we get what we call punching. So if there's a, if, if a movement is, is heavy and it's direct, but it's not sustained, what is that? Boom. Punch, right? That's a strong, direct movement, um, but it's sudden, and it doesn't, it doesn't last very long. Um, again, keeping one, so if I, if I keep the heavy and I keep the sustained, but I become indirect, what would be the opposite of going directly in the space? Slashing. So I'm gonna slash. You can slash with your body, you can slash with your limbs, you can um, slash any which way you like. Um, keeping uh, heavy and indirect, I'm gonna change the fact that that was very sudden to sustained, and we call that ringing. So ringing is if you wring out a towel, you know, to dry it, if you wring in your body, it's like this, and I, it looks silly out of context, but the thing is, if you, do, if you see on stage, you will see people, you know, actors that do these kind of movements, and that, that's ringing. Um, so now, moving to the, so those were all the heavy, uh, the heavy categories. If I move over, if I change one thing, so I'm gonna keep, the sustained, and I'm going to keep the indirect, but I'm going to make it light. That's floating. So I'm, I'm moving kind of 
I'm indirect. Um, this is slightly how I move in real life a little bit. Um, I, I, I float. I'm indirect, um, and, uh, but it's, it's sustained. Um, now, if I wanted to change one thing and make it not sustained, you flick. So a little flick is, is, an is, is something that's sudden, but it's still light and it's still uh, indirect. Um, now, keeping, keeping light and keeping uh, sudden, but direct, okay? Dab. So just a little, a little dab is direct, a, a flick is indirect. And the last one, if I keep direct and I keep light, but I make it um, sustained, that's gliding. So I'm going to glide through the space. Um, that was light. So, and you could also kind of look at them as juxtaposed to each other. So for example, um, pressing and gliding are both direct, and they're both sustained, but pressing is heavy. This is a heavy walk, and gliding is light. Does that, is that easily sort of visible? Okay. Um, and you can do that with all of them. You can just compare any two and say, okay, flicking and floating are both light and indirect, but one is sustained and one is uh, um, sudden. So how do I apply these to languages? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demonstrate this for you. Uh, I'm afraid to move to the next slide because I don't know if it's the one that I don't want to reveal yet. Um, but this is how I, this is how I, oh no, I, I can, can't I? Yeah, okay. Um, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes, um, and I'm going to speak a language, and I'm, not go I'm going to use the sounds of that language, and I'm going to apply the laban that I think that language belongs to, but I'm not going to use the grammatical structure, and I'm not going to use the vocabulary. And I want to see if you can tell me what language I'm speaking. And I, the only reason I want you to close your eyes is because I don't want you to be influenced by what I might be doing with my body because it's more about the sound. So everyone close your eyes. And when, I'm going to speak for about five seconds. And if you think you know what language I'm speaking, raise your hand. Don't shout it out. Just raise your hand and I'm going to ask. I'll start off easy. Da genero con l'hai persato, den non son fatto cincion tra belle sono chisto, dell'amarinto. Italian? Does everyone who raised their hand think I'm speaking Italian? Great. Close your eyes again. Rela contière, tu jantes au fessitrar, tu jantes au son bel art d'hommage, que n'a fit son ton chepis. Huh? What am I speaking? Great. Um, getting a little harder. Rela cothonesikis, te los otaros tos pus, que nos opiasmus. Greek, thank you. Uh, one more. Um, close your eyes. Kharav madavan, khazik melu, zekhat majovat makhotai, khalamitsakh. What am I speaking? Okay, well, some dis di people were disagreeing, but Hebrew, that's what I was going for. Uh, there's a couple more. Okay, close your eyes again. Sin koi shi hua, dian wo to sin pa, koi shi ma to cui shi ma ta. Yeah, what is it? Mandarin, thank you. Uh, two more. I'm going to save the hardest for last. Um, no, there's sorry, three more. Um, uh, Geren Rosen, die auf dem Flucht war obgerittet mit weißen Wachter. Dosen Schlichter. German? Okay. Last two. Close your eyes. Karosne bodnie, na dozla vodesh ni snachtu. Kash bliet na drosnov tidesh. Russian. Last one. This is, I think, is the hardest, so I'm really, I, I hope you'll get this one. Koros hat moros nikem dere belit noro, it na besh no gere mara potatom keneshen. Hungarian, great. Okay, you have proved my I, you've proved my point. I think. I hope it doesn't look like a cheap uh, gimmicky trick, but I'm going to tell you what I what I did. Um, on the next slide, uh, off. So here's the idea. What I was doing 
pressing. Hungarian to me sounds pressing. Um, why? So the, the, when, I, when I tried to figure out how, how I came to these, uh, these conclusions, I, 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 I listened and I compared. Um, so languages that sounded um, pressing, which to remind you, is it's sustained and it's heavy um, and it's direct. So sustained to me had to do with an even stress. Um, and and tended to be multisyllabic. So if something was was very even stressed as opposed to hearing um, you know really strongly certain syllables within a word. Um, and again, this is all relative. Okay, I'm talking. I'm not saying Hungarian doesn't have stress. Just relatively to uh, compared to other languages, I'm I think that there's a very even stress uh, to it. Um, and what do now again pressing and gliding would have something in common, right? They're both um, direct uh, and sustained, but I think that um, uh, I called. I said that German was gliding. So how? Do, so first, how did I decide what was heavy and what was light? So to me, light, the languages that were light had to do with the points of articulation in the mouth. So light languages tended to be very forward in the mouth. Um, so points, the more the more common points of articulation were um, the tip of the tongue, the back of the teeth, the lips, um, and also a lot of front vowels and pure vowels. Um, whereas the heavy languages tended to not necessarily be in the back of the mouth, actually, so it's not a direct uh, opposite, but rather a more sort of even spread of, of articulators within the mouth. So you, get, um, you do get some gutturals, uh, you know, in Hebrew, you get a sound like uh, in Russian, I don't even know how to classify that. Um, and um, uh, you, you get a lot of, uh, you, in all these languages, you get a lot of sounds that are made through the sides of the tongue, um, and a lot of, uh, or, you know, for example, uh, a dark L, um, or you, you get um, uh, a dark L, what else? Oh, and then and vowels that tend to be further in the back. Now, again, all of these languages are not going to have all of those things in common. These are just certain things that I noticed. Um, uh, how did I decide if something was indirect or direct? That had to do... Oh, did I, say, did I say that already, indirect? No, I didn't. So um, that had to do with sentence structure, actually. So direct languages, for me, had more, had stricter um, sentence structure. Uh, and also noticing now what I, what I put up there, I think uh, in some cases, uh, they could be, um, they could frequently have a f uh, the, act, the stressed syllable on the last, uh, the last syllable of the word, rather than the penultimate. Um, Indirect sentences had looser language structures, and uh, accordingly, what I notice in some of the indirect languages, well, particularly indirect and light, there's a lot more of that, I forget what the linguistic term for this is, but the, the thinking, um, um, the, the, the thinking uh, phoneme that people say, so, uh, 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 in Italian, uh, uh, and in English it's um, there, there's a lot more of that in the languages that I felt were indirect versus what I felt was direct. I don't, and maybe there is, and this could be my ignorance, but when I speak uh, with, with Germans, I don't hear it as frequently. Um, I, I, and I think, and again, this is my own cultural stereotype, and it has to do with the language that I'm coming from, which is English, in order to speak German, but I have to complete the whole thought before I start to say it. Um, because the infinitive comes at the end of the of the of the phrase, that kind. Of, so that therefore that kind of has a very sustained and direct uh, motion of, of the language for me, um, and that's how I approach speaking those languages. So I've covered uh, indirect and direct. Um, Heavy, by the way, can also have to do with, I think, the tone or the intonation. In fact, someone who I was talking to, I don't remember who it was, was telling me about how when she speaks a certain language, she notices that her, her intonation is just lower, her pitch is lower. And I, fi it was, oh, it was one of you, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I find that that's one of the reasons I put Hungarian in the heavy column, because otherwise it doesn't totally match the others in that sense. But for me, when I hear Hungarians speak Hungarian, um, the, 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 the stereotype, the broad brush that I go for is it's, it's, a, it's a lower pitched sound to my ear um, than Italian, which is always seems to be going up. Like, um, and so just checking on the time, I think uh, that's basically what I wanted to say and I just want to leave time for questions. Um, do I have time for questions?
Fi oh, oh, God, I'm so sorry. All right, so that's, that, thank you very much. You've been great, and I'd love to take some questions. Um, do you want to use the mic for questions? <laughs> thank you, that's very kind. Does, does anyone actually have questions? Yeah. It's going to be hard, I think. I'll just repeat it. Ooh, that's a really good question. How do you sustain your own sort of personality or, I mean, well, I don't want to like too complicated into acting, but obviously you might have different uh, personalities for different characters as well. And as I said, there's, um, in fact, I intended to whet your appetites for another, the future conferences or gatherings uh, by saying that, you know, some other tools that we use are things like animals. What 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 language? What animal is is your language? Maybe your Russian is is a polar bear. Um, <laughs> your Chinese could be an African hunting dog. Um, or another tool is um, uh, the seven sins. What sin does your language have? Is your is your Greek lustful? <laughs> does your Yiddish overeat? Mine, that overeating is what my Yiddish does. So, so the, but to answer your question more directly, um, yeah, there, you always bring a personality, but I will say there are, it, it, it takes refining because I know that I, the whole of my final year at school in London, I didn't act in my own accent once. It was always the British RP that I demonstrated and then the last uh, musical was an American musical but it was a period in New York so I was doing a New York, you know, a New York accent and um, um, there, there, the answer is sometimes you can't. There are certain things that it actually um, almost prevents you from doing, at least in my experience, uh, to fully bring yourself but um, I, think, I think it's a qu maybe a question of practice. The more you get used to it, um, the more you can be more of yourself um, even when you're sort of being a different character. But I think the reason why you can never fully is because part of our personalities is where we come and what language environment we brought up in and how we speak. It's very much has to do with who we are, I think. Um, so the answer is not entirely, but with a little practice, you can do it. See what I did there? That was my, that's my Jewish side coming out. That's that, 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 that intonation specifically. Well, what do people think of this? Does anybody have take issue with the fact that I think Italiano è molto è, è passionato? Is that the right word? Come? Ah, operatico, ma um, passionante. Is that better? Passionante. Sorry, this is not a language lesson for me. Um, the the uh, that that, I, that that's how it sounds to me, and I think. It has, that has to do with the lilt of the language, the fact that there are sometimes it's, it's that double consonant, bella. It, it always, it makes that sound ping out to you um, in order to create the sound. Um, I think uh, it has a lot, and it's, it's a lot the intonation. Um, ma dove stai andando adesso? Ma, ma perché, perché non parli italiano con me? Um, it, it, it's that kind of uh, that kind of up and downness that, to me, sounds very operatic. Um, and again, going back to Robin Williams, right? It, it's on the inside, so it's not to say that that Italians are shouting all the time and being very melodramatic. It's it's it, it, this is very subtle. They may do as well, but it's a it's a it's a subtle thing. Um, uh, oh, okay, Portuguese. Okay, okay, uh, that's a good, very good question. Um, the question is why is, uh, why did I put Russian uh, with Grecian? Um, and I think that has to do with, now I don't speak Russian, I only know bits of it, so it's harder for me to demonstrate with actual language, but um, there, there is a kind of, um, uh, it's a, it's about a suddenness of sound. So, for example, if I compare it to Chinese, what it does it what does it for me in the Chinese is um, is is the first tone. You know, uh, if you're counting e r san si wu liu qi ba jiu shi. That you know, I exaggerate it, of course, but that's what I do. Like I walk around my house sometimes, and I'm thinking like, what you know, what what how would something sound? You know, if I if I wanted to to uh, a ask someone how much something is, and it's 888. Uh, um, Renminbi, 
Um, it's that that pinging sound. So Russian for me, um, it obviously doesn't have that tonal element, but there is um, a kind of um, uh, I'll just I'll just say some random words that 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 echo in my head. Vturnik, vturnik. It's it's a it's 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 the quality of the vowel, but it's also the way it's said. Um, uh, it, there's there's this kind of it starts high and it goes and it goes a little bit higher before it goes down. So it's sort of a you know. But you know, you know. It's that it's that. Um, did, am I making myself slightly clear? So it's about a suddenness of sound as opposed to Italiano. Uh, it's there there again. It's a suddenness of sound, but to me, it's less it's less of an attack. Um, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> uh, I think probably we're out of time, and I know uh, my friend Lydia is next. So, oh, what Greek sentence? It was made up Greek. It wasn't really Greek. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. I I know I know I know I know some Homeric Greek. Uh, I <laughs> I'm speaking ancient Greek with the modern Greek, uh, you know. But to me, it has that dramatic sound. And that, I think, actually, in, in common with the Spanish, has to do with the breathiness. That, 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 that kind of... Uh, the <laughs> For those of you who have seen that YouTube video, yeah. Okay, I want to be done because Lydia's next. So thank you very much.